This week on Zizek and So On, we interview Todd McGowan, professor of English at the University of Vermont. Todd's thought centralizes on the likes of Hegel, Lacan, Freud, and Marx, and he is the author of several books, most notably Capitalism and Desire, The Psychic Cost of Free Markets, and last year's Emancipation After Hegel, Achieving a Contradictory Revolution. His newest book, Universality and Identity Politics, is set to come out this July. Todd also co-hosts a terrific podcast with Ryan Engley called Why Theory, and we encourage you guys to seek it out. Todd spoke with us this week about the unity of Hegel and Lacan that is present in both his work and Zizek's. We talked to him about post-structuralism, the concept of contradiction, and the problem of the subject. Welcome back. And so on and so on. And so on and so on. How are you doing, Todd? I'm good. Good to talk to you. So I guess the for, the first question we had was um, sort of how you first became aware of Zizek's work and if it was something, if you were maybe studying Hegel and Lacan beforehand or if it was something, the, the, the mixture of those things you came across through his work and and then how, how you kind of related with it subsequently. Yeah, sure. So I was, I, I had studied Hegel beforehand and I was very into Hegel. This is in graduate school. So it's in like 1990, end of 1991 when I was in graduate school. And, uh, and that's so sublime object of ideology had just come out and I was part of a theory reading group and we read it. And I can remember I was, I started reading it when I was taking a vacation in Boston and I, I called my closest friend and I'm like, whatever you're doing, stop doing it, pick up the book, start reading it. It's amazing. So that I, I really, it was a kind of like a, a epochal moment for me, but I, I was, I had had a good background in Hegel and was very influ- and interested in him, but, but Lacan, no. So I had only read the Acree and there was this terrible translation by Alan Sheridan was the only thing available. And, uh, I didn't really, I guess four fundamental concepts was available, but I hadn't looked at it. And I, I really thought Lacan, I just sort of dismissed him. So it was really, it was really Slavoj that brought me into Lacan, not the other way around. But Hegel, that's not true. So Hegel, I was already, I was already there. Why, why do you think you had dismissed Lacan beforehand? Well, I, I actually think, uh, so part of the way that people understood him was to associate him with post, what was called post-structuralism. Uh, and I was, I was against that. So I was sort of against Derrida, against Foucault and, and, and I just assumed that Lacan was the same thing. And then I tried to read the Ecree and I just thought it was almost indecipherable. So I, I just, I sort of lumped him in that basket like everyone did at the time. Yeah, I find that actually happens with Zizek as well. People often interpret him as a kind of postmodern thinker and that doesn't really seem correct in the same way, in a similar way as Lacan almost. Right. I think that's right. I think the same thing happens to Slavoj, although... You know, he does such a, he, he constantly is critical of, of what he, I think he calls it postmodern sophistry most of the time. So he's, he's very critical of it, but I think you're right. People still assimilate him to that. Like Peterson, I think, assimilated him to that position prior to their, their big debate. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Zizek was, was the first, uh, to really sort of conspicuously combine Hegel and Lacan? Well, yeah, in the way that he does, because, you know, Lacan was very influenced by Hegel through Alexander Kojev, who he went to his lectures in the 1930s. And, you know, so so Lacan himself thought he was Hegelian, but then he imagined he was breaking from Hegel at a certain point. I don't know what seminar I would say, maybe seminar seven or maybe even later, but he early on thought he was Hegelian and then later thought he was breaking. What's interesting about Slavoj's reading is that he, and Mladen Dalar, I think maybe is the first person to say it like this, that Slavoj sees the early Lacan as 
less Hegelian as the later Lacan. So at the, at the, as Lacan thinks he's breaking from Hegel, he's becoming more and more Hegelian. I think Slavoj and Mladen were the first to, to see that for sure. There's a, there, oh no, sorry. I was just going to say that, that in the, the, sub, uh, the text that you mentioned earlier, the sublime object of ideology, there's a, a great chapter uh, called Which Subject of the Real? where it seems that, that Slavoj's main focus is actually distinguishing Lacan from uh, the um, postmodern or uh, structuralist, post-structuralist um, take. And I think that he focuses in that chapter on Lacan's concept of the real, which um, I know in your podcast uh, you've spoken about Das Ding and Object Puti A, uh, and I think how these relate to the real, and I and I wonder if this is a concept in Lacan where we see a kind of breaking from, uh, despite some similarities to something like deconstruction, and a more bridging towards um, a, um, a joining with Hegel. And I wonder if if Zizek, uh, if it hinges on this concept of the real, if Zizek's wedding of of Lacan and Hegel uh, hinges specifically on on this concept. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think that's right. I think the real is is really important that that it. Um, that, it, that that for sure deconstruction would say we can't talk about the real. You know this famous statement by by Derrida, "Il n'y a pas de hors text." That there's nothing, there's no outside the text, and real is certainly. I mean, it's interesting because because I was going to say it's certainly outside the text, but of course it's it's you only get to the real through the text. So I think that's another thing that's important about Slavoj's reading of Lacan: the rejection of this idea of the real as this outside before symbolization, that it's through symbolization that we get to the real. So I think that's important. The other thing I would say is I think that the idea of subject is the is one of the points of connection between Hegel and Lacan. And subject is, you know, Deleuze, Guattari, Derrida, Foucault, subjectivity is something they're trying to undermine. I mean, I almost think those thinkers are pretty disparate. And that's why I think the term post-structuralist is it's not really a great term because just because it combines people that wouldn't want to be combined. <laughs> right. um, but nonetheless, I think the thing that does unite them is this rejection of, of the subject as a, I don't know, as a starting point for thought. And, and that's something that both Hegel and Lacan have in common. But of course, the subject is connected to the real. So those things are not at odds with each other. And then uh, I guess there's another specter in terms of, uh, what Zizek is doing some from sublime objects onwards is his intertwining with Marx into that uh, dynamic. So those three thinkers seem kind of, you know, for Zizek, very intertwined. And we've noticed that um, at least, you know, from what we've gleaned from your podcast, your uh, you go more for the um, combination of Hegel and Lacan and focus, it seems, less on Marx. Is that correct? I think that's fair. I mean, I, I do think that Marx's critique of capital is not bettered. I mean, I think it is, it's still the, it's still the, the gold standard. To put, I mean, that's a funny way to talk about <laughs> Marx's critique of capital. Um, but I, so I, I don't think Hegel has that, but I think there are certain aspects of, of Marx's, uh, I don't know what you call it, like his, his, overturning of Hegel that should we we would do better to retain the Hegelian way of thinking. So I, I do think of of Marxism in many ways as a as a political misstep, but I think in terms of economic analysis, it's it's not been it's not surpassed. There there do seem, however, to be things uh given the uh prevalence of Hegel in in uh Zizek's work um, there do seem to be central things of Hegel's philosophy that are that are very conspicuously missing from from Zizek. So, for instance, spirit and uh, mediation come to mind, and I, I wonder what you would say about that. Oh, that's an, I never thought of that. I mean, I always think I always think when he's talking about symbolic, he's talking about mediation, and I guess spirit. You're right. Like, there's not really a he doesn't talk about Geist. Which is you're right. It, I mean, it's it's central to what Hegel's doing. Although I think part of that is is Slavoj's tie to the logic and not to the phenomenology. You know, the Geist, the term Geist, doesn't appear once in the logic, and of course, it's it's everywhere in the phenomenology <laughs> phenomenology of spirit. Um, so I don't know. I think that may have something to do with it. Plus, I don't think 
You know, I wonder, I think it's not clear exactly what Hegel meant by it. And I, so maybe that's another reason why he's he's shying away from that. But I, about mediation, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, 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 I do see him as a critic of pretensions of immediacy. And so in that sense, I see him as talking about mediation, even though he doesn't, I don't know that he uses the word so much. What but do you I, mean by pretensions of immediacy? Well, like, I mean, so the the most common one today is something like affect theory, where right. we want to okay. examine, the, we want to take our point of departure uh, as our own, our own affects and not look at the way in which those exist as symbolized and mediated, that they're not, that those aren't any more authentic or pure or real than, I don't know, the thoughts that we have or something. So I, I think that that, it seems like that idea is pretty prevalent today that we can, we can, our feelings or our affects are, are, have some kind of higher claim than something like reason. So I think that's a, that's some, and I, I think he's pretty critical of that. So. Yeah, it seems as though he still um, heavily is influenced by the 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 Enlightenment thinkers, you know, um, and it's uh, in, and so like that seems to be his point of departure in, in critique of like performativity and affect and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it, it, certainly Kant and Hegel are Enlightenment thinkers, even though they're not exact. I mean, Hegel especially, I think, has a somewhat critical relationship to enlightenment, especially in phenomenology. But um, yeah, I think that those thinkers are, they're, they're his real points of departure. And I think it's almost, you know, I, I always have thought there's this great similarity between Slavoj and Sartre, that they're, that he's really mm. a kind of existentialist thinker. But I think that's one area where he's not, that I think he's much more like existentialist angst, I don't think is I don't think that's important to him as a as a huh. as a point of departure or as a as a concept. How how then would you see him to be a an existentialist thinker or otherwise? Uh, just because I think he's concerned with the way in which the symbolic structures break down, and that that the the point of the real there, the trauma of the real, is something that we can anchor ourselves on, and that so that I think that's where he's. He's linked to. I think that's a very existentialist notion that the that the. I mean, I think this notion that the big other doesn't exist is also. I mean, that's an idea from Lacan, but I think that's really an idea that Lacan takes over from Sartre. That idea that you know that there's no, there's really no substance that can underlie our our the ways that we make meaning, and instead. We just have to rely on our own ourselves. And I think that's another way of saying the big other doesn't exist. I mean, the Hegelian way of saying that is substance is subject, that there's no autonomous substance that we can ground ourselves on. So I think there's a whole line of thinkers that think it, but certainly Lacan takes that over from Sartre, I think. It's interesting, perhaps, and in also the way the subject is the kind of insertion of nothingness into, into being. Right. I mean, he constantly talks about the empty subject or right or the I mean, for Sartre, this is Sartre's term is the annihilating nothingness. That's what subjectivity is. And I think that's pretty close to how how Slavoj conceives of subjectivity. I mean, the only the difference is, of course, Sartre doesn't allow for the unconscious. So that's a so it would be a vastly different form of existentialism if you have no if you if you take into account the unconscious, I think. And this seems to be a different kind of um, impossibility of the subject, uh, especially when we're when we're speaking about Lacan and Hegel. That I think uh, sort of to circle back that the deconstructionists would uh, gesture towards in sort of uh, unspeakability. But that I think what what is the difference maybe with Hegel and Lacan uh, and 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 through them uh, Zizek that we allow to speak of the impossibility of the subject and, and sort of understand the, this impossibility as um, constitutive of the subject in a way that maybe post-structuralism, unfortunately we have to use that, that term, but um, misses or is unable to speak of or, or speak to. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, um, that in, for, for Slavoj, and I think he's right about this, that in things that are impossible can really happen. And so that we can actually... 
we can actually theorize and speak the impossible. So I think that's a key different, like for Derrida, he'd want to, like the, the impossible really has to remain impossible for deconstruction, I think. The impossible for Zizek seems to be often a political category. Does that seem right? Right. right. Yeah, it's definitely true. It's definitely true. And then, and, and, I mean, that's a difference from Lacan, I think, too, that, I mean, Lacan tends to use mathematical examples to theorize impossibility. Right. And Slavoj right. uses political ones. I mean, Lacan's conservative. So, uh-huh. I mean, it, it, it makes sense that he would he would do that. How would you read that in a in a Hegelian or Lacanian way, do you think? Read what? I'm sorry. Like his recourse to to mathematics rather than to the political sphere. Uh, is, it, is it because it's obscured or something? Yeah, I just think he thinks, well, I think he, I know he says there is no meta language, but I think Lacan thinks mathematics provides a, almost a meta language that can, that can, that can last, can endure. Like that he, he even thinks like it's a, the only teaching that can work without a transference. So I feel like he's invested in mathematics because he believes in its, I mean, I don't think he would go as far as Badu who thinks mathematics is ontology, but I do think he's close to that position. But I also think what you're hinting at is right that it's a retreat from politics. Like it's a, it's a he he it's a way to almost repress the political and and create these structures that have that. It's I mean, it's very tough to get politics into mathematics. <laughs> Sorry, Pete. Yeah. I'm I'm just curious. Um, now that we've mentioned the word ontology, um you know, the, the study or science of, of being just focusing in back in on the, on the sublime object. Um, I, I wonder, uh, even at these early stages with, with Zizek, uh, where we kind of get to, or begin to understand Zizek's project as one that is ontological. Um, and I wonder how something like the sublime object, which, which we've been at pains to sort of um, understand, especially in comparison to in the field of uh, terms like object putia and the real uh, and das Ding. Um, I wonder how the sublime object allows Zizek to um, formulate an ontology that that obviously he he begins to you know that he sort of rewrites in every book of his. Um, I wonder if you if you could help us understand maybe what what Zizek's ontological project is, maybe starting with something like the sublime object and and where we find ourselves today, and maybe even something with with your work uh, that's that's to come out. Um, if you could speak about that at all, yeah, sure. It's a bit of a lowball question there, Todd. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, so I think his I think his ontology. I think you're right to say it's developing more and more as his work goes on, but and that's I think. A, it's indexed to the increasing role that Hegel has in it. So I think as Hegel has a more minimal role in the earlier, not minimal, I mean, he has a presence in the earlier works, but he's not the central figure. Whereas in Less Than Nothing, the whole book's on Hegel, and Absolute Recoil, the whole book's on Hegel. I think at those points, ontology becomes more central. And I think it's an ontology of... It's interesting, because I've, I've asked him about this, and I, I don't think... I don't know how he... I'm not sure if he... He never answered me, really. Um that, that in, on the one hand, it's an ontology of incompleteness. And he uses the example of, um, there's this great movie, which came out the exact same year as The Matrix called 13th Floor. And in 13th Floor, there's this, it's a weird science fiction film, but the guy ends up getting to the end of his, he drives on this a street out of town and he uh, is in LA and he gets to the end of the, where the street ends. And it's, the, you can see the world ending and there's this kind of green, like matrixy stuff and, and everything is kind of is open. And, and it's like, he sees that the world just isn't finished. And so that idea I think is really important for Slavoj that he even says some point at which he says, I think he repeats this, that, that God didn't think we'd be able to get down to the low atomic level and see that things just aren't finished at that level. So I think that notion of incompleteness is on the one hand, what he thinks is ontological idea, but then the other idea is contradiction that, that everything is necessarily contradictory. So nothing nothing is nothing can cohere because it's really everything is at odds with itself so every entity is constantly self-destructing or or undermining itself so i don't know how those two i don't know that he's ever articulated the reconciliation of those two ideas but i do think those are his two ideas and maybe they maybe they just are the same i think you could think a way that they're the same but i almost think that they're not that there's some kind of tension between them 
Well, and and contradiction seems to function uh, a lot uh, between you and Ryan on your on your podcast uh, in a way that I find Zizek. Um, I don't necessarily see him using the word contradiction per se. Mo- I find that he tends more to use the word like antagonism or something like that. And I and I wonder why maybe contradiction, especially um, with your knowledge of Hegel, how does a concept like contradiction function more in your work uh, as opposed to to what we see in Zizek? If unless unless uh, really it's just a difference of terms. But is, uh, is there something behind contradiction that you see that maybe Zizek doesn't? Uh, speak to. Yeah, I don't know. I can't speak for him, but I, I do think you're that there is, I mean, here's, I'll just say why I use it instead of antagonism. Although I think antagonism is right in many cases. I just think what contradiction shows antagonism is occurs between two different entities, I think. And contradiction is can occur like that, but it also can be internal. And so I like the, and I guess you can think antagonism as internal, but I, I tend to think that it suggests opposition. And I, what I like about contradiction is that it, it is more an internal struggle and internal undermining. And I feel like, you know, that there's this, you know, this, this idea of a fight that's implicit in antagonism that I think contradiction doesn't necessarily, I mean, I think certain times things you have to fight about, but I just don't think, um, I guess I wouldn't say that I think fighting is, is, uh, all the time inherent in the structure of things that in some time, in some cases it's more art. We have to come to terms with ourself on our, our being at odds with ourselves. And then, you know, like the, uh, the external enemy or the external antagonism is sort of secondary to that. Interesting. But in, but in, in, I guess, ultimately you wouldn't settle on a kind of like um ontological position of, of it being like like equilibrium of like almost the Tao, for instance you, you think no in fact i think that's what contradiction reject i mean that's what i think hegel rejects thoroughly mm-hmm. then that, that in the if we really and he gets this it's really interesting that he gets this from the kantian antinomies of pure reason and so kant thinks these are the limits of reason because we can't you know Clearly, the world can't be at odds with itself. It can't be contradictory. And Hegel's like, why not? Like, why is our reason less than the world? Why is it worth less than the actual state of things? And so that, so I think that's interesting how Hegel gets that. And then he's absolutely opposed to some notion of harmony or just getting along even with ourselves. So I think that's, to me, that's the, that's what's at stake with the concept of contradiction. It seems, though, that that idea sort of installs the subject at a point of privilege, and I think that's what a lot of people have a problem with in the Hegelian system. So how do you think that that isn't the case, that that it's not a privileged position? No, no, I um, think it is the case. <laughs> I mean, I just don't think it's a problem. I don't think it's a problem at all. Like, I, I think right. that's right, that the subject has a, I mean, Hegel's whole point is that the privilege of the subject is that it can theorize contradiction rather than just be destroyed by it. So, so if I look outside and I see a tree dying, that tree in Hegel's idea is just destroyed by contradiction. But I'm, I'm destroyed by it too. Like I'm going to eventually, I'll probably die from coronavirus because I, <laughs> I have lung problems, but, um, but I'm going to die in some way and I'll, so I'll be destroyed by contradiction, but I also can think about it. I can theorize it. And so that's the, I can get some purchase on it. So that's the privilege of subjectivity. And I think that genuinely is the privilege of subjectivity. I don't think there's the, I don't think we have to apologize for that or, or somehow get beyond that. I mean, I think that's the, that's the, without that privilege, then we don't, we can't think anything. Well, and I think that, um, that, that, uh, contradiction in this way kind of, um, posits the subject, at least in Hegelian terms as historical, whereas harmony speaks to a kind of, I feel like, um, in quotes, post-historical, right? When, if everything was in harmony, then we wouldn't have the sort of coming into being and fading out of being that is essential to the Hegelian and, and in a way, the exi- like the existential notion of a subject um, that I think is inherent in contradiction, right? The, 
the coming and going, as it were. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. That that if there's a if there's a harmony, then there's a ability to get out of history. I mean, that that's maybe my objection. Not maybe it is my objection to Marxism. Like I think there's this idea that contradiction is ended with the epoch of capitalism, and that when we get out of capitalism, we get out of contradiction, and maybe even we get out of dialectics. I mean, that's a divide among Marxists, but I think that's what Marx himself thought. That. I think you might have discussed that a bit with your interview with Zizek on your podcast, but what what do you think he would say to to that sort of claim? Yeah, I think he agrees with that. I think, I mean, he, you know, he, it's in, I think the first time he said it was tearing with the negative. So it's like 1994, 93, something. Uh, And He says some. He says the time there's we've had we've been bombarded with all these Marxist critiques of Hegel, but perhaps the time has come for a Hegelian critique of Marx. So I think that's one of the ways in which he would he would think about that Hegelian critique of Marx. So we were all kind of educated in terms of Hegel in a very it seems a strangely traditional sort of way where we understood him as you know, philosophy of history and uh, the end of history and of teleology and systems. And it seems as though the Hegel that we come to with you and with Zizek is a very different sort of Hegel. And we're wondering, like, how how that relates. Like, is yours a kind of new interpretation of Hegel or is it um, almost more of a truer interpretation of Hegel? <laughs> I wouldn't want to say it's more mature. Uh, I think it's right, I guess. Um, but that's even more, um, I guess, self-aggrandizing <laughs> than more mature. Uh, 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 yeah, because everyone has their own truth, you know. Could you, you could just be speaking your truth, right? I, I don't. That is not my position. Um, yeah. So I, I, I would. I guess I would say that there. That was a. There was a really. I mean. I think there's no thinker who's been as radically misread as Hegel. And part of the reason I talk about this in my book, uh, Emancipation After Hegel, that I'm not trying to pimp it, sorry. Uh, uh, Go on Amazon. uh, And we're we're going to, we're going to do it anyway. Okay. Uh, But, but I think part of the, I think there's no thinker as misread as Hegel. And part of it is the way this, synthesis antithesis or I'm sorry thesis antithesis synthesis idea gets pasted onto him even though he never said it and never and his thought doesn't even resemble that so that's one problem but then I think that the way in which the philosophy of history gets privileged and this I talk about a little bit in the book that that that, that privilege is way out of whack with his whole philo- like you know he wrote four books in his life philosophy of history wasn't one of them it was the lectures that he gave about five, he started the lectures about five years into the lectures that he was giving. So it's not like philosophy of history is a central thing for him, but it gets like that becomes the first thing and maybe the only thing that people read about Hegel or from Hegel. Interesting. There's, there's it seems like there's also, um, Zizek mentioned it in our interview with him, and I believe you brought the name up as well, uh, Robert Pippin, in terms of the kind of more recent liberal interpretation of Hegel, one of recognition, and how where do you think that that differs from your own approach? Yeah, it differs radically. So, so yeah, Robert Pippin's one of the uh, one of the main figures of this, and the idea is that so they're they, they're they're thinking about Hegel in political terms, which I think is is good, but they're the idea really. Robert Brandom's the other main figure. The idea is that the end point of the Hegelian dialectic is a, a world of universal mutual recognition. And the problem is that Hegel himself never ends any of his books with that idea. So it gets it's kind of extrapolated from the master-slave dialectic. So it's a weird thing because Pippin became Robert Pippin attacking the privilege of the master-slave dialectic as it was inherited from Alexander Kojev. So this is his book, Hegel's Idealism, which is a really great book. Um, So it's interesting that he, in a way, with this philosophy of recognition, kind of comes back to the master-slave dialectic as the the ground of Hegel's thought. Because there's not really another place. There are a couple other moments in the encyclopedia where Hegel talks about mutual recognition, but it's never as an end point. It's never as an ideal that we aspire to. So it's, it's, to me, it's always been, I've never really understood it, actually, how it develops, except the only way I could explain to myself is that 
the master-slave dialectic gets so well written that it casts such a shadow over people's reading of Hegel that they 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 can't think outside of that in terms of what the political possibilities are. So where is it in Hegel's writings, would you say, is the most sort of like um, vital uh, um, source to look to for the sort of for, for today's political predicament? Well, I think the end, right? Like, so part of Hegel's idea is that you the the end is always. What? How do I should say it? It's 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 more authentic or or truer than the beginning. Like, even though. He also says everything is present in the beginning. It's only when you work things out that you understand where things are. So it's actually, I think, in the in the section on the absolute knowing and the phenomenology or the absolute idea and the logic that you see the necessity of, of reconciling yourself to contradiction. And I, my feeling is that that's the heart of any leftist political project, that, that maybe the, for me the difference between left and right is that right wants to escape contradiction and left wants to reconcile itself to contradiction or, or see the necessity of it. I, I had a question, Todd, that I, I, I'm sorry to go back to the sublime object of ideology, but I'm sort of shooting from the hip here. Um, I was wondering if your knowledge of, of, or your reading of Hegel can help us sort of move past, um, understanding the subject as necessarily embedded in an ideological system. And I, and I, in reading the book, I, I was kind of, uh, flummoxed by the totality of ideology sort of, he explains not necessarily how ideology functions, which, which I think is the first process or procedure of analysis of ideology, but, but why ideology? And I think it has a lot to do with going back to this, um, you know, this impossible, uh, in the symbolic realm that sort of situates the subject in a, in a really interesting existential position. And I, and I wonder how Hegel is for Zizek and maybe yourself, a kind of um, the, to get a, a, the tool to get beyond this impasse of the subject, sort of merely just a, um, a cog in, in an ideological framework or um, a construction of multiple ideologies uh, in which I, I find myself personally. Um, I wonder how Hegel really helps you or Zizek formulate an understanding of a subject, maybe uh, to use a Derridean term, to come, you know, a subject not yet uh, thought of or theorized. And I wonder how Hegel really is the is the tool there. Yeah, he, sure. He can, yeah, that's I, off the I, head, this but. may not be the answer you're looking for, but I think that he he it's it's precisely through the way in which he understands contradiction as being what determines the subject. So you're never just you're you're never just the result of ideology that you're always you're always produced as something more than what ideology is trying to create. And I think there's, you know, the psychoanalytic way of understanding that is through desire because desire develops through the interpretation of other desires, but that desire of the other you're interpreting, you never correctly interpret it. So it's that misinterpretation right. of the other's desire that is the subject's freedom. So it's, it's like you, you have the freedom to, because you're wrong, because you're a bad reader, like that's why you're free. So I think that that, I guess, so from both of those sides, from both the Hegelian and the Lacanian side, I think that there's a way to understand subjectivity, not just as a, a function of ideology or as a pure ideological determination. Right. So, so in the subject is, is this kind of, um, this demand to understand contradiction. And I, and I wonder how, like, how does one act in, in a purely theoretical realm here or, or not theoretical, maybe hy uh, hypothetical, how now, how do I engage with contradiction? Um, so that I'm not obviously, uh, in stasis, right. I, right. I accept contradiction and, and, and so now I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I still want to act. Um, how do I act in a way that accepts contradiction? Um, and I, can I, can I just, can I just, uh, leap onto that question very briefly? Because I really like the distinction, Todd, that Ryan drew between contradiction and, um, what was it, uh, being hypocritical. Okay. Uh, do you remember? I, I don't know. If you I don't remember that. that. But no, I, no, no. Okay. Sorry. Well, anyway, just uh, Jake's question, and if you can speak to that too. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think, like, I, I do. I, I mean, I always, I think of when I think of contradiction, like the and when you're what you said about hypocrisy reminded me of this. Like the the figure that comes to mind first of all is Trump, right? Like he doesn't think anything about contradicting himself. Like I understood that the virus was a real danger from the beginning, and clearly that's utterly contradictory because that's not what he said. So that seems to me hypocrisy 
versus contradiction. And I, the, so the way to engage contradiction is to, I don't think it necessarily means acting differently, although I think the result is acting differently, but I think it means engaging in politics without this, without the idea of healing attached to it. Like I'm not going to, my political engagement isn't going to be the thing that heals me. Instead, part of what I want to do is reveal the way in which things are not working out. Like this, this disharmony, like part of political action means making that clear. And, you know, that I, again, like that can just mean like a different way of thinking about politics and maybe it doesn't affect so much our action, but I think it affects like what you're willing to do and, and how far you're willing to go for your political project. Like, I think if you understand contradiction as, uh, impossible to escape, then I think something like the Stalinist project becomes impossible because what are you trying to, like, you wouldn't be trying, you wouldn't think that you could create a society in which there was perfect harmony. Right. And it, and I think it has to be a step further than, uh, Zizek mentions, uh, Peter Sloterdijk's concept of the cynical subject who sort of knows full well how, uh, ideology, ideology functions for them and yet sort of acts despite, right? Right. I mean, I think in a way, cynicism is an attempt to escape contradiction because it's an attempt to put yourself like I'm not in the I'm not in the fray, right? Like I'm outside the fray. And so I'm not subject to the same kind of, you know, contradictory forces that are acting on everybody else. So it's a way to kind of re, like remove right. yourself. Circumvent uh, contradiction. Right. I think that's right. Can you explain a little bit? I mean, your your podcast is called Why Theory? And there's uh, Zizek often talks about how in this political moment, we, we should not act, we should think. Can you maybe speak a little bit to the um, perhaps necessity or uh, usefulness of theory in this type of political situation? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important. And I think I kind of feel like there's a rebirth of it or a sense that it's important. And, and maybe a lot of it is due to Slavoj, because I think his global popularity has been great for just for the people's interest in theory. So I think that's really important. Uh, but I think that, that without the theoretical, I don't know, the, the theoretical lens or the theoretical mindset, you then you never, it's like you're acting blindly. You don't know where you should inter, like what's the right situation to intervene in? What's the right kind of intervention? I think that's all supplied by theory. But I also think that this opposition between theory and practice isn't real. Like I think that, that theorizing is itself a, a way of practice. I mean, I understand that you have to get out and actually do things too, but I think just theorizing is already... Uh, helping to change the world. Would you call that an idealist position? Yeah, I'm, I th I'm, I, I, it's funny because Slavoj really likes to call himself a materialist, but I've often had this discussion with him. Like, what, what's the problem? Like, Hegel called himself an idealist. I don't see the problem. I think he, th he, he wants to take back materialism for the left and for Hegel. But I feel like I don't know. I feel like there's I, I, I see, like I see the the. I guess I associate materialism with Marx and with this idea that people are fundamentally motivated by their interest. And I think the idea of psychoanalysis, it's kind of, I think psychoanalysis is almost an idealist enterprise itself, that we're motivated not by our interest, but by our desire. And those, th I mean, is desire material or is it idea? It's neither. So I think idealists, I think the whole debate is kind of not, it's, 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 it's a little bit off, but I do think that, that I, I, I would just be much more willing to side, say that I'm an idealist just because of the, what, what I think drives people mm -hmm. versus, uh, you know, versus materialism. Do you think, do you think that, um, being just a kind of vulgar materialist doesn't, um, allow for a, um, an awareness of negativity and the kind of constitutive nature of negativity. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think that right that that materialism is like the the, the most in its most vulgar form. I think it, it 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 all it sees is positivities, just as you're suggesting. So yeah, I think that's definitely true. That's interesting because when we were speaking with Jijak, he said a very similar thing, and I'm I'm like I do recall that he he does shy away from calling himself an idealist. Um, 
But well, I think he absolutely it, wouldn't call himself an idealist. Yeah. I mean, he, he thinks he's absolutely a dialectical materialist. The part of that is like he likes the he likes that dialectical materialism was associated with Stalin. So he likes to say things that are the most provocative. <laughs> yes, and, I mean, yeah. it's not it's he doesn't do it just because he's an idiot. He does it. He has a clear idea that he he's trying to provoke people into thinking. And if he can, he's almost using him serving himself up as the scapegoat. Like he'll be, you know, banned from certain newspapers papers or not allowed to teach at NYU anymore, all these things. But I think he thinks it's worth it because that the provocation of, of him uh, forces other people into thinking. So I, part of me thinks the, the, the claim to dialectical materialism is, is a lot of it is wrapped up in provocation. I like that because often when Zizek is, a, is about to make a provocation, he says, don't be afraid. It's that kind of like reassurance of, you know, it's okay. It's okay to take a step in this direction. Right. Right. Like right. acknowledging that he might be the catalyst for, you know, thought that we, we had made, you know, sort of theoretically taboo. Um, and I, I like that he does that. And then I think that, 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 that sort of suggests why he can be such a provocator and, and, and use such sort of, you know, we, we, um, we were talking with him and he brought up a, a reference to hardcore pornography and uh, I just I, I like to think that theory actually doesn't have any bounds or limits with Zizek and that we can, you know, think what we, we didn't think was worth theorizing. Um, anyway, that's that's well, that's I think I, that's his great like that's maybe one of his most important legacies that he brought all these different things into theoretical writing. I don't I mean. You know, I read theoretical writing prior to Zizek, and it was terrible. Like it was, like Derrida is a terrible <laughs> model for writing. Deleuze is not a great model. Foucault is a terrible model. But but Slavoj, the like he does his arguments don't always follow a straight line, but at least they're interesting. Like he, if you're bored at one point, he's going to bring up something like hardcore porn that's a little salacious and interesting in a few minutes. So I think that there's <laughs> that way of keeping making it interesting is I think really one of the greatest gifts that he left to theory. And now. Even I have colleagues that have they hate Slavoj. They have want nothing to do with them, but they still they still write with popular culture examples in their writing. And the other, you know, if it wasn't for him, they wouldn't be doing that. So I think that's a really good legacy. It seems. Well, will oh, sorry, I was just going to say about Will. Will you have a question? Um, yeah, that, it's been pressing you for many years. Yeah, yeah, it sort of dovetails off that because I think that. I mean, conspicuously, Zizek was absent from from our education and in our undergrads, and. It does seem like there's this sort of uh, just di may maybe disavow is too strong a word for it, but just he's just not there, you know, in in programs that should, should certainly be teaching Zizek just based on his on his prominence, I think, let alone his theoretical uh, uh, um, innovations. Nuance, nuance, yeah, yeah. So I just wonder what you think about that kind of um, absence of Zizek from the more academic world. Well, I mean, part the, yeah, good. Sorry. No, no. Uh, just to sort of like, it seems to be happening all the more these days. Yeah, I think that people find w reasons to dismiss him, but I think that's the reason why he's popular among people sort of on the side and outside of the academy. So I don't know. I don't know that you can win in that game. Like, you know, you, you're going to be popular in one area, not in another. But I think part of it is the way at least um, Anglo American philosophy is taught. So there's no, like, even if even if Slavoj didn't write in the way that he did, he would never be in, admitted into into American philosophy academies. Or I don't know how what what the dominant strain in Canada is, but for in it's here for analytical sure, analytical as well. It's analytic, so so there's yeah, no, yeah. you know, he's not going to find a space in there, no matter what. Like Hegel has right, no. Right, but sorry, but we were. I mean, just for reference, we were in a kind of more. Um, post-structuralist um, oh, dominated well co continental was was really the 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 emphasis at the beginning especially in first year uh which the, which then i think the route that was chosen was at least the trajectory was to end up at post-structuralism oh interesting so and, yeah i mean and, and i just found that there, that there was such an app will one of uh came up to me years ago and, and said you know you got to check out this guy slavoj zizek uh why didn't we read him <laughs> Like where where was he when we were studying, um, and that that absence is is yeah as as Will was saying seem, seemingly more prominent now um, than than it ever was. Yeah, I I, I, I agree. I, I think you know it's not <laughs> if people come to the University of Vermont they'll they'll take classes about him, <laughs> but uh, but yeah I think that's right. And I you know I don't know what to I just I think you, what you're you're sort of hitting on it that his 
like part of his writing style and his provocativeness makes him anathema to many people within structured academic programs. So I feel like, you know, I, I guess that's just the the pri- But I think that's always been true of psychoanalysis too. You know, psychoanalysis it's always a marginal it's a marginal thing because it's suggesting that we don't have control over our own our own being, and that's never going to be you know that's never going to be the main accepted thing. Right. Wow, I, I had not seen it from that that side. Yeah, I think it. I mean, I feel like that's you know, like think think about the way the role that Freud has in psychology departments. He's just a he's just a laughing stock. So I have part of the, the part of my job is that students come. They've had a psychology one hundred and one or whatever, and they come into my class, and I have to destroy their image that, that, that of Freud that got built up. So I feel like that's some that's something that's parallel, you know, between between Slavoj and, and the, all the whole history of psychoanalysis, Freud, Lacan. How do you go about destroying those types of um, ingrained notions that people, like mistaken ideas that people have? I don't know. I just say that they're mistaken ideas and try to, <laughs> okay. and try to show them that I know what I'm talking about. I mean, that's, you know, uh, you know, like the notion that Freud was a cokehead or that he that he wasn't scientific. I just say, yeah, that's right. He wasn't scientific. It's a, it's a, it's a philosophical theory. So there's a lot of ways. And then, you know, and then the unconscious is pretty easy to get people to accept. If you just think about the way they, you just talk about the way they interact with their friends and the way they read the unconscious and what their friends do and say all the time. So I think there's ways in which you can, you can show that psychoanalysis really has a lot of purchase on our, our daily lives. Yeah, it's like the normal rejoinder when, when if, if someone is presenting Freud as a legitimate figure, it's like, oh, that's the guy that loved his mother, right? So immediately you're starting to psychoanalyze Freud. Right, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for talking with us. All right. Thanks, guys. It was really yeah. had a nice Thanks. time. And so on and so on. So on and so on. So one and so one. So one and so one.